Okay, so what I'm going to show you in this tutorial is um, what I'm calling a voxelizer, which is essentially uh, a tool that analyzes a given geometry and splits it into voxels as a way of determining volume. Um, voxels are 3D pixels, and you can see on the left, uh, on the right-hand side, that the the form I've created um, has been rendered into voxels and then split into these different tiers of voxels. Um, They've been split according to a given percentage that I've uh, created in this panel. So you can see that if I edit this panel, um, the volume to, to say 50-50, the volume of uh, the geometry is then also split into 50-50. And this is actually very helpful because it's kind of hard or a little bit more complicated than expected to take an arbitrary volume or an arbitrary form and to divide it into two parts in relation to volume. You can imagine that if this was a massing model and the volume corresponds to program, then what you're seeing here is a 50-50 distribution of program, uh, which gives you new insights into uh, what kind of form you want to make. And you can imagine that, for example, if you're working on a project in which you want the building to be mixed use and to be split into half, yet you want one half to be more visible than the other, you could for find ways or massing strategies um, to create kind of a, a tall mast uh, or a tall kind of area uh, that's more visible um, and the lower half that's less visible even though uh, both sides have uh, similar volumes uh, or nearly exact volumes. Um, and this kind of division, a volumetric division, is possible with Python, it's possible with a hoop snake, but for this case um, I'm showing you an example with voxels. Okay, so I'm actually going to start out with um, a version of the spider sack, uh, an example that uh, should um, you may have covered in a previous uh, tutorial. Um, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm ha I have a bunch of points on a layer and I'm connecting those points together into a 3D hull. Um, and I'm syncing the cameras up together. And now, just for the sake of uh, performance, I'm going to disable the camera sync. And so what I want to do in order to create a voxelizer is I want to um, get a grid of points in fact, I want to get a three-dimensional grid array of points um, around this form. I want to then find all the points that exist inside of the form. And then on those points, I want to instantiate a box. I want to count the number of boxes slash points I have, and then I want to do kind of a distribution of uh, points um, or boxes based on an input. So if we go back into the pseudocode that we talked about um, at the very first class, uh, let's think of what we have to do. We have to get uh, get points inside volume based on a resolution, um, and then we want to create boxes on points. We also want to count the number of boxes. Count boxes based on given ratio, and then we want to display box display 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 boxes in the given colors. So um, you can imagine that these plug into each other. Um, and actually, because I wrote these as panels, figure like that, the content changes. But just imagine that these chain into each other, and these are these four steps. Um, so first of all, get points inside the volume. Um, now I'm actually gonna, going to rewrite these as uh, data objects, uh, because it's kind of convenient to and more illustrative to do that chaining. So let me just rewrite rewrite that. Okay, great. So these are how um, these elements chain together. Get points inside the volume, create boxes on the points, count the boxes, and display the boxes with colors. So let's tackle this first step. Get points inside the volume. So we have the volume here. This is actually our hull. You can see that I've highlighted it and it shows up um, in our interface. Get points inside the volume. So, what can I do now? This step, in of itself, right, um, can actually be its own. Uh, you can have many steps inside of it. I want to create a bounding box around um, this geometry, so I know what the maximum dimensions or how many points I need. And then I want to create an area of points, and then I want to uh, fill um, or detect which points are inside the geometry, which points are outside, and depending on that, I want I want to filter the points and only find the points that are inside. So if this is the geometry, then what I want to do is I want to create bounding box. I 
want to create an array of points or a 3D array of points. And then I want to find only points that are inside geometry. So this entire thing encompasses the get points inside volume chunk, right? And so then this would kind of plug into here. Um, so for, for, for the moment, again, let's just uh, kind of hone in on here. This is what we want to do. This is what we're doing. Create bounding box. So that's great. We have the bounding box function, which if I give it a geometry, it will give me a bounding box. Um, you can also right click on this and select union box and this will union or, or uh, boolean union all the geometry that you get um, and create a bond bounding box around everything or in this case this will create a bounding box around um, one thing. In this instance we only have one object so I'm just going to leave it um, at per object. Um, or union doesn't really matter. Um, so we have the create we, we've created a bounding box around geometry which is great. That's what we've done. We want to create a 3D area of points based on this geometry. So I'm going to go into analysis and go to, sorry, into surface analysis and go to deconstruct box. If I plug that in, what it gets me is it, gets, it gives me a domain from uh, 34 to, uh, um, sorry, negative 34 to 4.39. So it gives me the domain of the XYZ dimensions. Um, what I can do in Grasshopper Smart Enough is that if I plug that domain into a number, it will actually give me the amplitude. So I'll subtract the end of the domain with from the start of the domain, and go, it'll give me the amplitude of the domain. So now in X, Y, Z direction, I know um, how big it is. So I need an error of points, but first of all, I need a resolution. How close together are the points? So I'm going to make a little slider, and I'm going to have it start at uh, 3, just so that um, we don't fall into... Uh, the danger of, say, having um, points too close together um, and uh, making our script slower. So I'm, and then I'm going to divide each of these numbers by um, this number, uh, this resolution. So in this case, I get uh, 3.875, which is great. But um, what I want is, b uh, I want to know how many points I will need if I have, say, a resolution of five, a point every five units. And I, so I want this to be an integer, not a decimal point. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the round function or the round component. I'm going to plug it in. And I'm going to use the ceiling because I want to round up. I want to get um, more points than is necessary um, just because we're going to later then filter the points that are inside the geometry anyways. And so this is kind of my roundup component. What I can do is actually I can group this together, middle click, click cluster, and then I can call it roundup. And I'm going to put a hashtag in front of it. This is just my personal not notation that lets me know when something is a cluster as to distinguish it from this. So now I'm using this as my roundup component, and I can uh, plug all the other dimensions into it, and I can see that, oh, okay, great. This is round it's rounding up for me. It's telling me that in, in the x dimension I need eight points, etc. So I'm still in here. I'm still doing this. I'm not even creating the 3D array of points yet. Right. So I want to create a 3D array. Now there are a few ways to do this. I could uh, you do this manually or I can use the box array command. Um, and I will actually do that now. So what this requires is a base geometry. So it takes a given geometry and you give it a box with dimensions and then it arrays that box or it arrays the geometry according to the dimensions of the box. Um, and so the number of elements, this is the number of elements. So I need um, X, Y, Z, I'll plug those in. Um, and it requires you to give it a box, which is to say the unit of repetition. Um, so if the box is one by one by one, you're telling it to uh, repeat in X, Y, and Z directions, one unit by one, by one unit. Um, I am going to give it uh, a box and give it uh, because our unit is based on this number, this resolution I'm just going to feed it 5, 5, and 5 um, but you notice one thing is that the box takes uh, the size of the box in x direction and if I increase it uh, no actually never mind um, ok great so I have this box so I'm going to plug this box into here and then now it wants to know what geometry it should copy. 
Um, and I'll tell it, for example, if I tell it to copy this box, now I get a grid of boxes. And this grid of boxes mimics, seems to mimic this box, but it's um, actually way bigger. And I believe this is because uh, when the box component takes an X, Y, and Z, uh, it's actually moving in, say, if this is 6, it's creating a box from negative 6 to positive 6 in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. You can see by hovering your mouse over here. Which means that, really, we have to divide this number into two. Um, I'm going to stretch the canvas. This can, you can be done by holding out and moving. This is really convenient sometimes. So I want to do this by plugging, uh, dividing the initial resolution into two because if the box is stretching x y using this number five, uh, six, and for negative six and plus six, it's doubling the size of the box, ideally. And we don't want that. So this is the size of our actual box, which means that if we look at the area box, it kind of looks like this, which is the same size roughly as the union box. So that's great. But it's not located in the right place. Um, what we want to do, and the reason why this is because it starts from this initial geometry that we've given, which is this box. But we don't want it to do that. We want it to start from... Uh, the core from the lower right hand corner of this union box. So what we're going to do is we need to find the lower right hand side corner of this union box because the behavior of this array box is to take a geometry and just um, copy it positively in the x, y, z direction. So we want the lower right hand side or the the corner of the box that's the most s the smallest in the x, y, z direction. And in order to do that, I'm going to do another surface analysis, and I'm going to get um, deconstruct BRAP. And if I plug the box into here, what I will get is I will get the faces, edges, and vertices of the box. Now I'm going to take the vertices of the box, and then you can also have this component called sort points, which is great. So then it'll give me all the points, and I'll sort them in order, um, and in increasing order of x, y, and z. So which means that if I get the first point that's sorted, it will be the point with the smallest x, y, and z value, which is right here, which is perfect. So, and instead of repeating the box, I'm actually going to repeat this point, which means that I get um, this array of points, if that makes sense. I'm taking this point, and I'm taking, uh, and the unit of repetition, or the dimensions of repetition, are identical to this box. And then I'm copying it 7, 14, and 11 times, so I get this grid around this union box, which is great. You can see that uh, the relationship between this point grid and this box. So now I have this area of points. That's great. Um, now, what I want to do, or I've already created three area of points, actually. So, huzzah. So find only the points that are inside geometry. How do I do this? Well, I can find, uh, I can do an inside and outside check. I can do a test. Grasshopper, um, kind of filtering works on tests. And because the initial geometry is a mesh, I'm going to go into mesh and say mesh inclusion. And what this is, is test up whether a point is in a mesh or not. So given a mesh and a bunch of points, um, and how strict you want to be, it will give you true false values. So this is the point, and this is the mesh. And if I look at what it's giving me, it gives me a bunch of true and false values. So based on those, so based on those, you can uh, use a dispatch tool. Um, if you haven't used this, this is what kind of analo analogous to an if statement in coding, where you can give it a bunch of true-false uh, uh, values and a bunch of geometry or any any other form of data, and you can use it to sort it into two uh, lists: the ones that um, were from true values, the ones that corresponded to the true uh, values, and the ones that corresponded to the false. So if I look at the one in A. You can see that, oh, you know, that's great. They approximate uh, the initial shape of uh, the initial geometry. Um, but because our points are not too f close together, uh, it kind of looks a little less exact. If I, I'm going to change this to rational. If I make them closer together, you can see that the points s start to more approximate um, the larger geometry of the entire form. And you can see why I uh, limited the slider to three because we're already getting, I don't know how many points here, let's see. We're already getting around 1,000 points, 1,128 points. Um, so I don't want to slow down uh, our operation if we can. This is pretty interesting and pretty
pretty hypnotic. Okay, so great. So now we have the points inside uh, the form, which is great. And actually, that's exactly what we wanted to do here. Find only the points that were inside geometry. I'll plug this in here. And one thing that we can do is uh, we can make more clusters. Or in the spirit of uh, this kind of pseudocode, right? I can say, well, what did this do? Um, I'm going to plug this input into geometry uh, geometry item here to kind of clean it up. What, are what does this do? This um, essentially does the function of finding only points that are in ge inside geometry. So I'm going to make it into a cluster and say point inside geo. There we go, that does that. The same goes for uh, creating a 3D area of points or even creating a bounding box. So this creates a bounding box. So I'll say, you know, or let's let's be a little bit more helpful and say um, get uh, get number of points needed, perhaps. Or maybe um, maybe I can combine the two things and just grab everything here and say this creates an area of points. Now notice right now I've selected everything but uh, the slider. Um, now if I create a cluster. I got a cluster with four items coming to the slider, um, which is kind of messy. So what I can do, I'm going to undo. I can have the slider plug into a number component, have the number then plug into everything else. And that way, when I make a cluster, uh, it becomes vastly cleaner, like this. I can say, make point array. So that's uh, one way in which. Um, my code can become much cleaner on my patch. So that's great. I've got the three area of points. Find the points inside geometry. And now let's go back to here. Let's move this over here. What next? Now we have to create the boxes on the points, right? Um, so we have the points. We want to create the box in the points. Um, a few things. One is that now we can create a box and we can move it to all these points. The other thing is that if you go back to here, if you remember, uh, this array box command uses a piece of geometry. And we've chosen to make points uh, based on where they are. What we could have also done is uh, we could also take this box, uh, this box geometry, and done the dispatch, the true false, based not on the points, but on the box. Um, here's what I mean. And that can sometimes be the pitfall of uh, using clusters too early. But bear with me. So I create the boxes on points. Now, we know that our, um, but but actually, you know what? Let's just, uh, let's just uh, go forward. So this is our resolution of our box. and. We want to create boxes on the points. So what can we do? Well, we can do a few things. We can make a box centered on a plane using uh, doing the same thing we did earlier with uh, dividing the dimensions by 2, plugging the box dimensions into x, y, and z. And then we can orient or move the box from where it is to all these points. Now, the box takes a, w uh, a plane as an input. And if we plug in an XY plane, the plane also takes an uh, origin or dots as input. So if we take these points and we plug this into here, we get all these boxes, which is exactly what we want. So this is we've effectively created the, the boxes on points. Um, awesome. I could cluster this. I could also group this, um, just for visually speaking. But uh, that's um, that's. Uh, that's kind of uh, what we've done. Now, counting the boxes based on a given ratio. Well, we need a given ratio. So let's assume that uh, we want 10, 20, 10, 20, 30, 40. Uh, that's already 100% percent, um, percent distributions. I'm going to make it multi-line data. So each um, data point, instead of a string with uh, multiple uh, line breaks, um, it's actually four different items. Now we want to count boxes on a given ratio, which means that we want to get, uh, if this is 10, we want to get 10% of the boxes. Um, now we can assume that uh, whoever is typing this in is having these all add up to 100%. Or we could just uh, add um, a 
we, we, we could uh, play it safe or, you know, assume that maybe someone will put in like ratios 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. And so we'll try to convert this into the percentage of the, of the total. So we'll plug it into a mass addition component. We'll do a division. So we'll say, okay, I want each number divided by the total. And that gets us this number. It's no surprise, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Um, this is helpful if, um, you know, you have these arbitrary numbers. And here you can find out, okay, this is the, the percentage distribution. So this is our given ratio. And we want to get these boxes, and we have 821 boxes, and divide them according to this ratio. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we have, within the list component, uh, the list commands, we have um, partition list which is it gives you given a list and given a bunch of numbers or sizes of numbers it will partition a bunch of data in the form of a list into multiple chunks so we know that this is our the ratio of our different chunks of lists um, but we don't know how exactly long how long we want the list list to be at least yet but we do know that um, we have 821 values here so I'm going to get list length so it gives us 821. Now if I multiply the length of each list with the ratio that each chunk should be, then I will get the lengths of each list right, as decimal points. And again, because we're dealing with discrete numbers, we want integers. So I can you know, uh, use the round component. Um, I can also use the integer component and just plug it in. And uh, Graspo will try to convert it uh, intelligently for me. Um, and I can plug the integer component into here and the box into here. So again, uh, what this is doing is it's taking the list of 821 boxes and divvying them into these four chunks based on this ratio. And if I look at what I, this looks like, uh, you can see that, um, it's, well, it's a little hard to see here. Let me show you the parameter viewer. If I plug it in, data with four branches, and each branch has these numbers, these this many items in it. I'm going to use the simplify tool and just clean it up a little bit. So now I've done that. I've counted the boxes given on the, uh, based on the given ratio. So I want to display the boxes with colors. How do I do this? Well, um, I have, first of all, how many colors do I need, right? Well, there are four of these. So I need four colors. That's great. So I need four colors here. And I need four random colors. So I'm going to use the random tool, which if you give it a number of values, it will spit out a number of random numbers. Um, and I'm going to use the color RGB uh, component, but the one that uses floating point values from 0 to 1. And I'm going to plug this in. Um, so then it gives me four random colors. And I'm going to use the preview function, the custom preview, to say, okay, I want this geometry colored with this colors. But this probably will not work yet. Oh, and um, because I've had uh, this only draw preview geometry selection on, I'm going to uncheck this, which means that I'm going to get a lot of stuff. And then I'm going to select everything but the preview component and hide it. Okay, so this is what I get. And again, it doesn't work. It didn't work. Now, why is that? This is because if I use the pram viewer, I have data with four branches. This is what it looks like. This is a tree trunk, and four. Uh, this is four separate branches. Now, my data over here, the colors, is data with one branch. Um, and so when I give it all these colors, uh, it's... Um, it's not matching up each chunk, each branch with one color. So wh what I want to do is I want to have these four colors beyond the each branch too. So I'm going to right click use the graph command, data with four branches, which is great. I'm going to simplify it just because it looks nice. So that means that each of these endpoints is a piece of data and each and it will correspond to each of these uh, branches, which is a list of geometry. So you can see that this division happened like that, which is great. But uh, and and if I kind of make the distributions a little bit more equal, say twenty, you can see how they split up, split. But these colors are kind of drab, and especially because it's the R, G, and B values are all the same, uh, so they're kind of on this monogram scale. Well, let's say another one, another one, and I want this one to be green and blue, 
well, it doesn't change. Well, why is that? Well, one quick crash course is that no, very few numbers or no numbers in computers, no random numbers are truly random, but pseudo-random, which is to say that they follow this mathematical formula. So if, if you notice, there's uh, this component called seed here, or this input called seed. Now, the seed is um, kind of a little kernel that the mathematical formula uses uh, at the start to make random numbers. If you change that, the kind of randomness changes. So let's say we set this to 3 and we set you can see the numbers already changed this to three again they are identical but if i change the seed of the randomness then the kind of randomness that each component has will be different so we'll get uh different colors which is great uh i could have a third one right so then all three numbers all rgb values would be different uh make sure the size are um, the sliders the seeds are different so then now we have this representation of uh these three colors which is great I'm going to hide everything, making sure. It seems like I'm missing. I may have accidentally shown something. Okay, great. Um, so now uh, I've displayed the boxes with colors, and I've displayed them based on this uh, proportion. Now you might, uh, and I'm actually going to show this only in the representation view. So I'm going to right click, representation view. Great. And then I'm going to turn our. Uh, our camera sync timer back on, so great. So this is a simple voxelizer. And you might ask, well, why uh, does the voxelizer divide it um, horizontally? Now that's because uh, the way the list is organized, the list of points or the list of boxes, is that it's just going from uh, x to y and up in the z direction. And you can imagine that if you want it to be sliced differently or randomly, then the question is about reordering that list in a very specific way um, to accommodate the kind of slicing or the kind of voxelization you want. Um, and the more uh, detailed our resolution becomes, uh, the more accurate, or the, the more small, the smaller our resolution, the more accurate uh, this will be. So instead of 3.3405, and make it smaller you can see the resolution gets pretty high if i make it larger then we're kind of dealing with this low pixel uh kind of rough version of a form so that's the vo voxelizer um, and it'll come in handy in the future when analyzing geometry of form uh sorry it'll come in handy when analyzing geometry of form in relation to volume uh because then um you can take this volume and do further analyses on the specific types of volume one, two, two options or two avenues I've pursued before. One is to use attractive points to grab certain amounts of volume around an area and to do an analysis on volumes locally. And so that way you can relate a uh, geometric form to program. You can say this chunk I'm grabbing is public space. It is retail. It is um, a kitchen. It is, you know, some sort of uh, programmatic, has some sort of programmatic functional architectural uh, relevance. Um, the other analysis you can do is to actually bake this geometry and then to uh, move this geometry around and then to make a new form, uh, which is to say the representation or the pixel version influencing the interface. So that's it for the voxelization example.